I uh, had the honor recently of uh, traveling back to Georgia to my uh, hometown and giving this presentation to the, uh, the County Historical Society there. So uh, that was a great night and that's really an uh, exciting thing to be able to tell some of the true history to other groups as well. But uh, this grew out of uh, this book right here. Georgia remembers Gettysburg, and here we go. Got a nice poster up here. And by the way, uh, just a little uh, uh, shameless self-promotion here. I do have books, uh, not too many. I only got four copies. Uh, just about sold out. Uh, however, I've got more copies just arrived today at home. But uh, before I had a chance to get them, uh, they're fifteen dollars a piece, and uh, I have my previous books as well. So. Just so nobody can accuse me of not uh, having any self-interest here. Well, what makes Gordon's brigade significant at Gettysburg? Gordon was the tip of the spear in the Gettysburg campaign. His brigade was at the head of Early's division and Ewell's corps. And they were literally the first brigade to cross the Potomac River to head into the north in the northern invasion. They were the first troops to hear General Lee's orders about not molesting uh, the uh, local citizenry or destroying their property or stealing their property. You know, anything that's non-military, nothing, you know, no civilian targets, basically. Lee was very strict about that. They were the first ones to hear these orders. And Gordon would, uh, would recite them to the uh, citizens of Pennsylvania on several occasions while he was up there. Because these people were scared to death because they saw what they, or they had heard, what their troops were doing down south. So it only goes to reason that they're going to think that we're going to do the same thing when we go north. Suddenly the war uh, that had been far and distant and really uh, disinteresting to them was very personal because now it was on their turf. Gordon crossed the river on June 22nd, 1863 at Boonesboro, Maryland. They were the first Land troops, first ground troops. Now you had infant, I mean, you had cavalry up there, and which was one of the problems, as you'll see, in the, and I'm sure you've all heard about how that was a problem. That the cavalry had been uh, racing around over there, and they had totally lost connection with General Lee. The infantry brigades did not know where their cavalry was. So they had lost their eyes and ears. Their main source of intelligence was out of touch. They had been skirmishing up north. So you hear various claims of who was first. Now you hear uh, it was a North Carolina regiment. I don't remember which one was the first uh, to uh, to be engaged in the Battle of Gettysburg. However, the first land troops, the first infantry troops to be engaged in the entire campaign was in Gordon's brigade. So on June 26, they arrived in Gettysburg. There were just a handful of militia and home guard troops that they quickly brushed aside and they tucked their tail between their legs and ran and Gordon had the town to himself. They camped there, they spent the night, they owned the town on June 26. They were there by themselves. The rest of Early's division was back uh, behind them uh, towards uh, Chambersburg. Now, let me show you the uh, this map here. The way it worked, they, they crossed over here, and then they went up to Chambersburg. Then at uh, Chambersburg, Ewell split his corps in two. He sent Early's division down towards Gettysburg, all right, through Cashtown and into Gettysburg, and the rest of Ewell's corps 
went up towards Harrisburg. Their real goal, they never intended to fight at Gettysburg. Their real goal was to capture Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. That was a significant northern capital. That would have been not only uh, a significant victory, it would have been a great moral victory for the southern army to capture the capital of Pennsylvania. So Yule heads towards Harrisburg. He sends them towards Gettysburg, and they were going to head on through and go over and capture, well actually, the original orders were to burn the Columbia Wrightsville Bridge. Now this is going to figure prominently in this, uh, this story. As soon as uh, Jubal Early is, is out of sight of uh, Yule, he starts thinking about it, and he decides that rather than burning this bridge, why does he not capture it? If they hold that bridge, then they have the ability to move their army to the other side of the Susquehanna River. Once they do that, once they're on the eastern bank of the Susquehanna River, they can either march right up on Harrisburg, or if they go this way, the field is wide open for Philadelphia. And then not too far beyond that, you've got uh, a little ways down, you've got Washington, D.C or as they call it then, Washington City. At this point, Meade's army is still in Virginia. They've slipped around Meade and headed into Pennsylvania without him before he knew they were gone. That is why they, they had this clash at Gettysburg, because literally Meade is moving back up through Virginia to try to catch them. They've slipped them. He cannot allow them to just go plundering through the north. The, the northern people are now scared to death. They don't have their army up there to protect them. General Darius Couch is in Harrisburg, and he has nothing but state militia who have never been in battle. These are just basically local guys. You know, they basically are calling up the National Guard, but not even, not even anything as good as the National Guard. These are guys that haven't even been trained. They just put uniforms on, hand them a rifle, and suddenly you're the militia. And they are expected to hold the line against veteran Confederate soldiers that have been in the war for two years now. They have seen, you know, as they said, they've seen the elephant time and again. And they know that they are no match for them. So General Couch orders the militia that they are not to allow that bridge to be captured at any cost. No matter what, they can't allow that to fall in Confederate hands. So, June 27th, Gordon is on the move again. He moves him from Gettysburg, heading towards Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, which is on the western shore. They go through York. Now, let me tell you a little bit about their target, the Wrightsville. Columbia Bridge. Here's an aerial shot of where this is the existing bridge, this is a, our today's bridge. And this bank right here, that is Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. On this side you can just barely see the shore, but on this side is Columbia, Pennsylvania. These little islands right there. Those are the stone piers from the original bridge. Now that bridge was originally, the first bridge was built in 1812. It was destroyed by a major ice storm. You had ice flows coming down, they knocked the, uh, the, uh, the piers out from under it and it flowed down the river. And they rebuilt it in 1834 with this bridge. And they put stone piers very strong, as you see, they're, they're there today. And um, I'll go ahead and show you this picture that I took while I was up there. This is the, uh, the bridge that's there today, and if you look through there, you can see these stone piers uh, looking through there. Susquehanna River is a very wide river. This is a, it's a big, wide river. And 
you really cannot ferry all these troops across, and there's nowhere to ford in a reasonable area there. So they need to capture this bridge. So they head into York, Pennsylvania. There is a battalion of state militia, Pennsylvania militia, in in York, uh, Pennsylvania. All right. It's commanded by a major, and the uh, the mayor of York orders this major to take his troops and leave. He says, your little battalion of green troops are no match for a whole army of Confederates that are heading this way. These are veteran soldiers. The only thing that you're going to accomplish is getting our town burned. Once again, remember, that's what they expect because that's what they would do. We'll find out pretty quickly that that's not the way that Confederates operate. The Wrightsville Columbia Bridge is an engineering marvel. This is the longest covered bridge on the face of the earth. The longest covered bridge that has ever been built. It was considered one of the uh, one of the engineering wonders of the world. This bridge was known all over the world. This was a very significant piece of, uh, of engineering. And here is a, uh, an artist rendering of the bridge. This is the way that bridge looked. And it was in three parts. You had one bay that the railroad ran on. You had another bay that was for foot and horse traffic, the hauled wagons and so forth, and people walked across it. It was a toll bridge. It was totally self-sustaining. There was a bank, the Columbia Wrightsville Bridge Bank, that existed to service this bridge. And there's a third bay right here, this kind of funny looking, it's got a little slot in the roof there. You see there are barges down here. You hauled barges across on that bay. You threw the rope over through this slot in the, in the, uh, in the roof and the horses would haul the barge across. So it was really a neat functional uh, bridge there. Okay, so now back to York, Pennsylvania. The mayor has ordered the troops out of uh, York. They retreat from York, they head to Wrightsville. They dig in around the bridge. The mayor of York puts together a, uh, a delegation of local citizens and they meet Gordon out on the road and surrender the town. Now this is a pretty big deal because let's think about this, whether you're aware of this or not. York, Pennsylvania was at one time the capital of the United States of America. When the uh, Continental Congress was forced to evacuate Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Philadelphia was captured by the British, they retreated to York and that's where they were conducting the business <coughs> of, the, uh, of the new country. So they're now, the, uh, the uh, former capital of the United States is now in Confederate hands. It has been surrendered to them. They meet Gordon out on the road. Gordon accepts their surrender, promises that they will not be harmed. And they head on in to, uh, to York then. People had gathered all along the streets there in York. Mostly women and children. Mostly children. The, the men were nowhere to be found. The men were hiding. They were afraid. They were hiding inside. Uh, some of the women were hiding. Some of them were a little more brave. It was mostly like uh, teenagers, uh, young teenagers and children that were out there. And they were gathered around and uh, Gordon realized that uh, his men looked a little scruffy so he decided to put their minds at ease and he made a, a speech before the people telling them that, you know, reciting Lee's orders that they would not be harmed, their property would not be seized, no non-military targets would be harmed, uh, would be uh, touched. And he pledged to them the head of any man that violated that order. 
as he's about to ride off and take his men, about a 12-year-old girl comes out of the crowd carrying a bouquet of roses. She presents these roses to General Gordon. General Gordon was a dapper, handsome young man. He was about 30 years old, and he was quite a dandy, and he knew it, and he was very proud of himself. He was, uh, he was much beloved by his men, but he was, he was uh, much beloved by himself as well. So let's, uh, let's not make any uh, mistake about that. So he accepts these. He's quite flattered. Uh, and he pretty quickly realizes what a real gift he's been given because in amongst these roses, there's a folded piece of paper. He takes this paper out, he unfolds it, and on that paper are the complete plans, troop strengths, troop placements, everything pertaining to the militia in Wrightsville. He knows where every soldier is around that bridge, where all of their trenches are, everything. It goes so far as to, to tell him about a ravine that runs parallel to the river where if he so desires, he could take his troops around and use it as cover for a flanking movement to capture this bridge. Well, naturally, he doesn't quite know what to think about this. Uh, he could be being set up. He doesn't know. They stay in York but a short while and then they head on. It's only about another 15 miles to get to... Uh, <coughs> pull my map back out here. If I were better organized, I'd have it right here at hand. It's about 30 miles from, from uh, Gettysburg to York. And then it's only about another, actually 13 miles from York to Wrightsville. So they're most of the way there. So now they depart and they head on to, to uh, Wrightsville. So he calls a halt as they uh, reach the edge of Wrightsville. And Gordon and a few of his men ride on ahead alone to reconnoiter and scout this situation out. There's a high ground around there. He was able to scout this out and find that the, uh, that the intelligence he had received was completely correct. Everything that that note said was right. So he goes back and he orders his men forward to capture that bridge. So as they approach the bridge, they get within a few blocks of it. They're beginning to meet uh, some resistance. They're quickly rolling these, uh, these troops up and forcing them back towards the bridge. As they get nearer, suddenly a, a series of loud pops start erupting around the bridge on one side of it. They don't know what this is, but naturally uh, when you're a soldier and you're marching into a danger and you start hearing loud pops, you're going to think you're being shot at. So they open fire and they, uh, they go into the full charge on the bridge at that point. Later on, reminiscing, the soldiers would all say that they didn't think it was gunfire. They could not figure out what that was, but they, they said it sounded like firecrackers. But nobody could ever agree on what, that, what the source of those, those bangs were. Anyway, that, that started the uh, action at the bridge. Pretty quickly, they drove these militiamen out of the trenches and forced them back on the bridge. The militia is retreating across the bridge. The Confederates are right behind them, chasing them. <coughs> and pretty quickly, they start to realize that uh, they're hearing a roaring and it's getting hot. And they realize that the bridge is on fire. As I said, you can you can see this is a fairly broad river here. So let's say that you're along about right here and you realize that this bridge is on fire. At some point that bridge is going to burn up and fall down in the river. Well, you don't either you neither want to fall into the river with it 
nor do you want to uh, be one of the few troops that actually makes it over here and be on the wrong side of the river where the rest of your army is over here. So naturally, they're going to retreat back uh, to their side of the river. Their mission originally was to capture this bridge. Now their mission is to save this bridge. So they got the soldiers. They form a bucket brigade. They're ready to, you know, they're looking. Uh, they got plenty of water down there. What they don't have is buckets. So they go to the citizen. Where are your buckets? Where are your wash pans? Anything we can use? Fight this fire. You've never seen a group of people in your life that were so ignorant about where buckets might be as you as these people were. Buckets? We don't have any buckets. What's a bucket? They've never heard of a bucket. This bridge is burning now. Just like depicted in this uh, this painting here. This is from the perspective of the uh, Columbia side. So you see the fire there on the right cell side. Right beside the bridge on the right cell side <coughs> on the right cell bank is a lumber yard. So you got this bridge is uh, 30 years old, all wood. It's a tinder box. It's catching up real fast, it's throwing flames, you know, dozens of feet to the air. These flames or these embers are coming down on the wood in the lumber yard. You got just tons and tons and tons of wood stacked up there. Pretty soon, that's fully engulfed. It's throwing, uh, throwing it 100 feet in the air. Well, guess where those embers are coming down on? It's coming down on the roofs of the houses in Columbia. I mean, in uh, Wrightsville. So, these houses along the edge of the, uh, uh, the bank of the river there are now catching fire. Suddenly, those people in Wrightsville remembered where that was that they put those buckets. All of a sudden, you had buckets coming out of their ears. There were buckets everywhere. Wash pans, everything. There's a little piece of information I want to share with you here that, would, that makes this interesting. They kind of have a dilemma. Let me tell you something that they found out. According to General Clement A. Evans, who wrote the, uh, I believe it was nine volume, History of the Confederate Military. <clears throat> Clement A. Evans was the colonel of the 31st Georgia under Gordon, and he was there that day. He said that on that very day that the officers of that brigade had read in the northern newspapers about how two regiments of federal troops had marched in and deliberately burned the town of Gary in Georgia. Well, these soldiers knew that. They talked to their officers. They would have known this. So you have this brigade of Georgians who have just discovered that very day that one of their towns in their home state has been deliberately burned by the Northern Army. And here they are expected to put out a fire that they didn't even set on the Northern town. You know, you have a little, uh, little inner turmoil there. Do I do the right thing or do I not do the right thing? They didn't hesitate. They formed their bucket brigade and they took those buckets and they fought that fire. Fire was getting the better of them. Those houses were burning quickly. They were beating it back, but uh, it, was, it was marching on. They went so far as to take what they call their pioneer troops what we would call engineers today. And they took kegs of powder and they planted them under houses along the edge of the fire and they blew these houses up to create a fire break. That gave them the breathing room they needed to be able to put this fire out. So they fought that fire and they beat it. There were just uh, a few houses along the edge of the uh, river there, the edge of the fire that were lost. 
They saved most of the town. They saved the town of Wrightsville. I had the, uh, the pleasure of eating in a, in a restaurant, and it was right there in sight of the, uh, of the bridge, both the old and new. And I got to tell the uh, waitress that my great-grandfather was one of the men that saved your town there. And, uh, and she thought that was really cool. Now, if she really thought it was cool, she would have given me a free meal, but uh, so much for Northern hospitality. Right? Okay. Well, Gordon and his men were the toast of the town then. This town uh, was nearly toast itself, but now they were the toast of it. Gordon was... Uh, Word was sent to Gordon from the chief burgess of the town, a man named James McGee, through his daughter, Mrs. Uh, Luther Ruwalt, that he offered Gordon his, his home to stay in and to use as his headquarters. Gordon accepted. Next morning, Mrs. Ruwalt sent word to Gordon, inviting him and as many of his men as her dining room would hold breakfast. Once again he accepted. They had some good time of fellowship. He was thinking perhaps these are, they're treating me so well that perhaps these are southern sympathizers. He found out really quickly that uh, his spy was not among these people and indeed these people were so, uh, solid unionists. They were not southern sympathizers. They were just uh, grateful. They knew what he did and there is a, uh, I understand there's a museum in that town. I haven't had the opportunity to find it, but uh, to this day about that fire. Right uh, the weekend before I visited there during the sesquicentennial, they actually had a sesquicentennial celebration there at the river of the, uh, of the burning of the bridge. And uh, they had a big festival there. So. So Gordon uh, is spending his time with these people, enjoys his breakfast. During that time, though, he receives orders to return to Gettysburg. Lee is massing his army to Gettysburg now. So they're going to retrace their steps, roughly. They came that way. Through York, so they're going to go back this way, and they're going to kind of come in at the northeast. So they're ordered to uh, march at double quick, where they will arrive back between 2:30 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon back at uh, Gettysburg. And uh, at 3:30 in the afternoon, they are ordered. Into, into battle against uh, at Blocker's Knoll, where Dole's brigade, also of their fellow Georgians, is fighting against uh, Barlow's division, Barlow's uh, federal division. And Dole is, is holding his own, but uh, he's, he's losing ground, so they need reinforcements. Gordon is sent to their defense, to their uh, aid. They come in on the left of Dole. At 3.30, they will cross Rock Creek and emerge from the woods and begin their assault on Blocker's Knoll, which is today, if you go there today, it's called Barlow's Knoll, but I don't know why it's called Barlow's Knoll, because all that Barlow accomplished there was getting himself nearly killed and having his uh, entire division tuck their tails between their legs and run all the way back to Gettysburg. But I'll tell you more about that in a minute. If they wanted to rename it, they should either call it Gordon or Dole's uh, Knoll. But, but uh, then again, it's uh, their state, I guess. This painting right here on the cover is a Don Troiani painting that depicts that very moment when they emerge from the woods and they are, are beginning their assault on Blocker's Knoll. Here's Gordon right there. And you will see that's, uh, you'll see where the, that depiction comes from here in a minute. So 
At 75 yard, within 75 yards of the enemy, he orders his men to halt and fire a volley. They fire one volley, then they continue their, uh, their march under heavy fire, and they will at one point be standing within 50 paces of the enemy trading volleys with them against Von Gilson's brigade. They quickly defeat and roll up Von Gilsa. Von Gilsa will, will beat a hasty retreat to the, to the rear. At this point, the other brigade that has been fighting against Doles is uh, the, the brigade of Adelbert Ames. Now, Adelbert Ames was the original commander of the 20th Maine that was so famous at Gettysburg. You know, uh, if you've seen the movie Gettysburg, Jeff Daniels plays uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, at that time, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Joshua L. Chamberlain. He was the commander of the 20th Maine. Adelbert Ames had been his commander before he took command. Adelbert Ames was now the uh, brigade commander there, and now his right flank was totally exposed when Von Gilsa caved, and he's fighting Doles on his left flank and his front. And suddenly, his right flank is totally unsupported. Gordon then crashes into it, and now Ames is in serious trouble, and pretty quickly his forces fold up too, and the entire division is now totally routed, and they are in full flight back to the town of Gettysburg. They are literally running, chasing these federal soldiers back to town. They will do a, make a brief stop along the way when uh, a New York regiment will run across their path. They're also uh, been routed and they are also retreating, but they think they see an opportunity. They see this, they, they run into the flank of these Georgia troops and they set up and they open fire on them. They fire one volley. But what they don't realize is that there are two regiments of Georgia troops that are, are behind fences out of their sight, and they quickly rise up, and they are covered on three sides by these, uh, these Georgians, and the ones that they're firing on are on the other side. So they are now totally surrounded by these uh, Georgia troops. And they say that within 10 minutes, Every one of those New Yorkers is either dead on the ground or has its hands in the air. They're either dead or they are prisoners. So, after that brief stop, then they continue on and they literally chase them all the way through town. They now, once again, own the town of Gettysburg. Now, let me, uh, let me tell you uh, a description that, that inspired this, uh, this painting. One soldier described Gordon this way, said he was standing in his stirrups, bareheaded, hat in hands, arms extended, and in a voice like a trumpet exhorting his men. It was superb, absolutely thrilling. Gordon was much beloved by his men. This was his first major engagement as their brigade commander. He had been temporarily commanding uh, Rhodes' old brigade, which was largely Alabamans, Alabamians or whatever. And he had been the colonel of the 6th Alabama, even though he was a Georgia man. He had, uh, his company that he helped form had actually been in the 6th Alabama. So he had been the commander of the 6th Alabama. Then when this position came open, from General Alexander Lawton, he took over that brigade. His was his, his trial by fire with them. They would be devoted to him for the rest of his life. They would love him. And when he gets to the far side of town, Gordon is asked where his dead and wounded were. He replied, he says, I haven't got any, sir. The Almighty has covered my men with his shield and buckler. Uh, of course, this is a bit of an overstatement. Of course he had some dead and wounded. I can name you a few names. In fact, when I was in uh, Elbert County, Georgia, I, I told some of the local residents, including the commander of the 38th Georgia, was uh, killed 
but it was so light to where it was considered a negligible amount, enough to, so that he wasn't really aware of uh, any dead or wounded. He wasn't concerned about them. That night, they're sent out to the York Road to guard against the flanking movement. Remember, once again, the cavalry is still unknown. We don't know where the cavalry is, so Robert E. Lee does not know where any, flank, any flanking movements or counterattacks are coming from. All he can rely on are reports from spies and rumors from the locals. So you have these brigades being sent out all over the different parts of town. They're sent out to the York Road at the railroad uh, cut to guard against one of these flanking movements. This attack never came. They would be lightly engaged the next day, very little, but essentially they would not be engaged anymore during the battle until the retreat. During the retreat, they would, be, uh, they would form the rear guard. The 26th Georgia protected the wagon train, and uh, Meade's army actually did try to pursue Lee. Remember though, they've been fighting for three days just like we have, so they're pretty tired and at that point it is more important to Lee to get his army back across the uh, river. If you're a Confederate soldier, you're more interested in getting the Potomac between uh, you and them than they are in continuing to pursue you. So that determines who's going to fight harder. Meade figures out pretty quickly that it's not worth it to pursue them. In fact, uh, Gordon reported about a spirited skirmish succeeded in driving back the enemy's advance guard and it withdrawing this regiment through the woods with the loss of eight or ten killed and wounded. Now here's the fun part. That's essentially the story of it, but I want to read you a first-hand account of some of Gordon's men from the evening after the first day from the picket uh, raid that they did. And just here in the uh, headline, you know, I think you're going to like it. Two men capture 280 Yankees at Gettysburg. On the first day of July 1863 at Gettysburg, Gordon's brigade fought the enemy on the north side of town, and after a severe battle, the Yankees retreated. Gordon's brigade advancing on them and formed a line of battle in rear of the county asylum. In front of that building was a large three-story brick barn in which a large number of federal troops had taken refuge. A call was made for men to volunteer as skirmishers as the position was a most dangerous one and required soldiers of steady nerves and clear heads. Jephthah E. Campbell, Green Seymour, William Kirby, John Keene, Jasper Harbin, Phil W. and Phil W. Alexander, all Elbert County boys, well, full disclosure here, Elbert County is my home, my home county uh, back in Georgia, so. And members of Company H stepped forward, this is the 38th Georgia, stepped forward and announced their readiness to undertake the dangerous service. They were told to go on picket duty and take all prisoners who wished to surrender, penetrating the enemy's lines as far as possible. The brick barn described was about 250 yards from the Confederate line of battle and directly in the path of the gallant party of skirmishers. Campbell and Kirby went directly to the barn and entered its door. They were surprised to find the building filled with Yankee soldiers. And it didn't take the boys long to discover they were in a mighty close place. Kirby who knew not the meaning of the word fear, began to curse and abuse the Yankees for everything he could think of. Jeff Campbell says he decided on a different and more conciliatory policy and explaining to the soldiers that Kirby was drunk and not responsible for what he said called on them to surrender. Now, let's think about this, all right? Two Confederate soldiers walk into a barn full of armed Yankee soldiers. One of them's first reaction is to cuss them all out, and then the other one is to say, ignore him, he's drunk. 
And oh, by the way, you all need to surrender. So he tells them, he says, that the barn was surrounded by Confederates and the building would be riddled by shells unless they give themselves up. The soldiers who were badly demoralized by the defeat of the day believed all that Campbell told them and consented to lay down their arms and surrender so as not to let them know that the enemy who surrounded them were only two in number. <coughs> Campbell made them march from the rear door of the barn by pairs, laying down their arms as they did so. Thus, 280 federal soldiers surrendered to and at the order of only two Elbert County boys and were marched back and turned over to the command. So two men get 280 Yankees to surrender, lay down their arms, and they march them 250 yards back to their, uh, to their command and turn them over to the provost. Says this was one of the most remarkable captures made during the war and shows what nerve and daring can accomplish. That nerve and daring, that's one word for it. <laughs> so, in the meantime, the other skirmishes had not been idle. Seymour and King went above the barn, around the garden, where they opened fire on a large squad of Yankees stationed there forcing them to vacate their position. Two guys walk up there. There's a large squad of Yankees down there. Two guys open fire with single shot muskets, open fire on them and forces them to vacate their position and fall back into the town. Phil Alexander went below the garden and walking toward a federal battery ordered it to cease firing. They seeing only one person commanded him to surrender. This the brave soldier refused to do, and he was cut down by a sword and taken prisoner. Now there are varying uh, reports on how Phil Alexander was wounded, but uh, he was wounded in his, uh, I believe his left hip. Nonetheless, some say uh, he was shot. Some say, uh, this account says he was cut by a saber. I don't know. You know how it is. A lot of this was written 30 years after the fact, so. Uh, you're going to have a little bit different memories there. But now, it's, it gets good. It's, st it's still good. Campbell, Seymour, King, Kirby, and Harbin all then united and went over into the town of Gettysburg and mingled freely with the Yankee troops who were too much demoralized to molest them. They visited the federal hospitals and saw the wounded men treated walking around as freely in the federal camp as the Yankees themselves. Mr. Campbell says the Confederates could have easily taken the heights that evening as the federal troops were so badly confused and demoralized. General Gordon wanted to go on, but he was forbidden to do so. And he goes on talking about that uh, a little bit. And Interesting thing that uh, made this really personal to me. This was actually the first uh, story that I collected for this collection. I collected this uh, years ago when I was doing some personal research. And I would not know for several years until I started investigating one line of my family that I had not looked into that I would discover that uh, Jeff Campbell, who helped uh, capture those Yankees, was actually my great great uncle by marriage. So, uh, so that made it kind of personal. But now, you've all heard that one Confederate soldier was, it's always been said, was the equal of seven Yankees. I'm sure most of you heard that. We know now that that's not true. We've got evidence right here that proves that the actual number, the correct number, is actually 140. <laughs> so, that's the way that, uh, so that's how we now know that one Confederate soldier is equal to 140 Yankees. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, and uh, like I said, I have books to settle naturally. But, uh, all right, if there are no questions, I'll turn it back over to Commander. Thank you very much. <laughs>